experimenting with various gas burners for a model steam boiler. I bought a large gas-fired steam plant and it didn't have a burner. So I looked through my box of old burners and tried this one first and this was not good at all. It didn't give much heat and the flame kept blowing out. So I tried this one that I made several years ago and all this does is gives a massive yellow flame. The jet's not right. Originally it worked but I kept drilling the jet out to see what happened if I took the jet size up. And now the jet's so big it doesn't work at all and putting this in a boiler would just make the boiler very sooty. And then I tried this one, which was a burner that I made several years ago too. And this doesn't work either. It gives a slightly better flame, but it's not big enough for this steam plant. I need something substantial. It's not the running of the boiler when it's in steam that's the problem. It's raising steam from cold. And this small burner would be no good at all. This burner came from Max Steam. It's a standard Max Steam burner of the later type. It just needs a gas jet. This is a sievert blowtorch head and it's one of a few that I have in the outer part of my workshop where I do the silver soldering. And luckily my piece of silicone rubber just pushes into the hole in the back of the burner. Lots of heat and lots of noise. I'll try a larger burner because I do find that the larger burners don't seem to be as noisy as the smaller ones. This is about the largest that I can fit in the boiler, so I need to modify it slightly. Over now to my small Boxford lathe, and I put the burner in the chuck, I'm using a twist drill to drill tapping size for 5 sixteenths by 32 threads per inch down the centre of the burner. Obviously not all the way through though. After I drilled the tapping size hole, I threaded the hole using a tap. This modification doesn't do any damage to the burner head and it still fits onto the sieve at blowtorch body. But the good thing is now all I really need is a standard 5 sixteenths by 32 union and I can pipe gas to it from anywhere. For this application though, I do need to make an adapter. And this will fit into the gas burner holder that came with the steam plant, and the other end of it will allow me to connect it to a gas tank. It's a simple plain turning job. What I'm doing at the moment is turning the outer diameter so that it fits inside the threaded area of the burner head. I don't need to thread this part, and I don't have a die of that size anyway. The main diameter of this adapter needs to fit in the gas burner holder that came with the steam plant. The easiest way to make sure that the adapter fits in the holder is to offer the holder up to the adapter whilst it's in the lathe and see if it fits. And once I got the correct diameter, I just needed to machine the brass all the way down so it fitted in the holder. The next part of the job is to accurately turn the end of the piece of bar down to 5 sixteenths of an inch. This of course will be threaded and it needs to be accurate, hence the micrometer. This clip shows me using a centre drill to drill down the centre of the bar and the centre drill will also make the recess for the coned union that's going to fit in there. Now I'm drilling all the way through using a 5 30 seconds of an inch twist drill. This is followed by cutting a thread on the end on the 5 16 of an inch part using a die in the tailstock die holder. I always try a union nut on the new thread to make sure it's not too tight or too slack. And as that seems okay, I can part off the piece of brass. Brass is quite easy to part off, it's far easier than parting off steel, and it's very much easier than parting off stainless steel, and eventually it falls off into the chip tray. And it's now time to work on the other end. Initially I need to turn this end of the piece of brass to fit into the burner head, and that's about right, so I'll take a cut all the way down. As I mentioned earlier, I'm not cutting a thread on this outer part, it just needs to be the correct size to just fit inside the threaded part of the burner head. As usual, I'm removing any sharp edges with a file. When filing in the lathe, always make sure that your file has a proper handle fitted to it and keep it clear of the chuck jaws at all times. And once again, in exactly the same way as previously shown, I need to reduce this to 5 16 of an inch. Not approximately 5 16 of an inch, exactly 5 16 of an inch. So there's a lot of micrometering going on, and eventually I get it dead right. And once again, I don't want any sharp edges that make up my fingers, so I just remove any sharp edges with the file. And now the tailstock die holder comes into play once again, and in exactly the same way as previously shown, I'm rotating the die holder by hand. And also, as previously shown, I first of all clean off the thread, and then I try a 5 16 by 32 threads per inch nut on it. And here I'm trying the burner head in place, and it fits perfectly.
not tight and not slack. And here comes the centre drill, I'm using this to create the recess that matches the cone on the coned union. And once again I use a 5 of an inch diameter drill to drill down the centre, but I don't need to go very far because I drilled most of the way through from the other end. All I need now is some Loctite 542 to seal the thread and make sure there are no gas leaks. The 542 will seal the thread perfectly, but I'm also using a high temperature silicone o-ring. Fitting an o-ring like this is not essential, but it seemed like a good idea to make sure that the burner head sits firmly up against the adapter. And it's time now to fit the adapter into the holder. When I first fitted the adapter, I fitted it this way round. I'd like to take this opportunity to apologise for the state of this piece of copper pipe. And now it's time to light the burner, put it in position and see if it works. Well it lights ok and there aren't any leaks. With the burner fitted in this position in the holder it's too close to the boiler. So I reversed it in the holder which allowed me to move it away. And that lets more air in and you get a cleaner burn. Although I definitely can't recommend going around sniffing the chimneys of model steam boilers. The smell emanating from the chimney is a good indication of whether you're getting complete or incomplete combustion. With some burners, I've even been able to light gas coming out of the top of the chimney with a lighter, so you have a flame on the top of the chimney which is very un-steam engine like, and if you're steaming inside, which is never recommended really, it does of course fill the room with gas. I find that a blow lamp type burner is better slightly outside the fire hole. This burner arrangement is giving far too much heat for this job and it's also giving off carbon monoxide according to the alarm. So I cut a 5 16 by 32 thread in the next size down burner head that I had and I'm trying that now. The good thing about making these modifications to my different size sievert gas blowtorch heads is that it doesn't affect the functionality of them when I fit them back onto the sievert holder and use them for silver soldering. The second blowtorch head also set off the carbon monoxide alarm, so I'm trying a third one now, and this is the one I use for most of the piping silver soldering applications. And it was the one that actually came with the blowtorch set when I first bought it many years ago. So if this also trips the carbon monoxide alarm, I'm a bit stuck, but I don't think it's going to do that. This is a much smaller flame. Also, of course, these are designed for propane via a regulator. I don't use propane for model steam engines, and I don't know what it's like elsewhere, but in England, I'm told that you're not allowed to use propane for firing model steam boilers. I'm using the commercial canisters that are used on picnic stoves and such like, and these are full of 70% butane and 30% propane. But the problem is, they chill very easily. As they chill, the pressure drops, and the whole performance of the gas burner alters. This gas burner seems fine. The pressure's raising fairly quickly, but it's slowed down a bit, the tank is now very very cold because as the liquid gas inside the tank is evaporating the temperature of the gas and the tank drop rapidly. In the previous clip I used the heat from my hands to warm the tank and in no time at all suddenly everything got better and the pressure increased and the safety valve started to blow off. So this burner works quite well. Once the boiler's working pressure is reached I just turn down the gas and the burner's a lot quieter. I'm going to revisit this Max Steam ceramic burner. This particular burner was taken out of a Max Steam boiler because it kept overheating. I spoke to Mike Abbott about this and he said it was the type of ceramic he was using. This is very similar to the ceramic that's used in Bix burners and they're also prone to the same problem if the position of the jet is incorrectly set. As suddenly the flame sucks back inside the burner and burns inside the burner and cremates the ceramic. So I changed the ceramic for the type that Mike Abbott used to use in his early burners. They always seemed to work very well. They howled a bit, but they worked very well. This howling is a real pain. You put the burner in the boiler and it howls. Listen to it. It seems that some kind of resonance starts as the air moves through the boiler and it's worse in this Scotch return flue because it's a longer flue. I'll try and play a tune with it. Anyway, I just don't want this. It would really spoil the fun of steaming the boiler. Even the roar of a blow lamp type burner is better than the howling that you just heard. If I keep the ceramic burner outside the boiler, and it's probably a good idea because it's quite fiddly to fit it, then I don't get this horrible howling noise. 
I've made an adapter to mount this in the holder, so I think I'll give it a try and see how well the boiler steams. For this Victoria mill engine to run at a realistic speed, whether it's driving anything or not, it doesn't need that much pressure. 30 pounds per square inch is more than adequate. And provided that I don't put the ceramic burner too close to the fire hole, it's not going to sing. When the howling starts, the flames take on an entirely different appearance. I used a piece of brass tube to cover the end of the burner and make it look tidier, and I fastened this to the burner with two 6BA bolts. And I think the overall effect is quite pleasing. I quite like the warm glow in the fire tube. But best of all, I like the silence. Listen. No noise. Well, no great noise to speak of. And it's infinitely better than the roar of the blow lamp. It may be less efficient, it may not raise steam quite as quickly, but that's not the point. Running a model steam engine like this is meant to be a very relaxing pastime. There's no urgency at all. You can just watch the wheel going round and let the rest of the world go by. It's quite unlike running a model steam locomotive pulling passengers. That's quite stressful at times. Raising steam didn't take too long and there's more than enough heat to run the engine successfully. You'll notice that the engine is not making that knocking noise anymore. Several viewers got it right, well spotted. The problem was the crank web. It was loose on the crankshaft and this is very common. I noticed that there was a small pin in with the casting set that I recently bought as I'm serialising the build of a Stuart Victoria on this channel. And I won't be using the supplied pin. I'm going to use a taper reamer and ream the hole tapered and fit a taper pin, which is just what I did to this crank web. And here's the process speeded up considerably. And now the engine doesn't knock at all. That's it for now. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.